Is God sending you a message? I heard the voice of the Lord speak to me and say, it's not just a dream. Get up and pray. Jane Hammond unravels the meaning of dreams and visions. It is your responsibility to learn to discern the voice of God. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Are you one of those people who not only dreams while you sleep, but you also remember it the next morning? What if there was a message in that dream from God? Well, author and pastor Jane Hammond says God often speaks through dreams because it's happened to her. Years ago, Jane Hammond dreamed her brother was in trouble and decided to pray. The next day, she found out her brother had been in a car accident, but survived. Jane realized God was speaking to her through that dream. After studying scripture, she says that God has very specific reasons for speaking to us through our dreams. If you are a believer, I believe that if God is speaking to you, then it is your responsibility to learn to discern the voice of God. In her book, Dreams and Visions, Jane explains how to interpret our dreams and what you can do to better understand God's voice. Okay, well, let's kick it off with you, you've had a dream, somebody's had a dream, they're wondering what is the meaning of the dream. What would you tell them? Well, I would tell them that uh, the Bible actually says that God will speak to you in a dream or in a vision. Mm -hmm. And so just number one, raising the awareness for people that God actually can be speaking through a dream or a vision. I remember when I first had my very first dream, I went to my pastor and he had no idea that that could be one of the ways that God would speak to you and communicate his message and communicate his will to you. So um, my passion really is to number one, raise the awareness for people so that they know God is speaking and that God can speak. The second thing is then to kind of take them through a step-by-step -step process of learning to hear the message and discern the message that God has for them in the dreams. Well, why have we lost that? Because I think we have. Uh, you, you look in, in both the Old and New Testament, God clearly speaking in dreams clearly speaking in dreams to unbelievers, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to Nebuchadnezzar, right. to Pharaoh. He, he's having th these kinds of communications, but in, in our world today, we tend to dismiss it. We tend to say, well, I had too much pepperoni. Or, <laughs> right. You know, well, I do believe in pizza dreams too. So th I think that th <laughs> those can happen as well. <laughs> um, but learning to discern between which is God and what's, what's the pizza that you ate last night. You know, um, there, there kind of came a, a time in history when most of the world uh, actually embraced the fact that God, or if in a pagan culture, gods spoke in dreams. Um, the Bible is actually an Eastern book, not Western thinking. And so the Bible is actually full of dreams. There's actually 50 different occurrences in the scripture where God spoke to somebody in a dream or a vision from Genesis to Revelation. And so this is obviously a very prolific way that God spoke in the times of the writing of the scriptures. And people uh, accepted that, they understood that, and they embraced it. And But then as kind of humanism kind of came in, humanism kind of started dismissing the the supernatural or uh, or the, the, the flights of fantasy that would happen at night when you slept, and then they you kind of coined the phrase, it's just a dream. And so a dream, if it's just a dream, then you just dismiss it as an imagination and you don't put any value on it. Well, what clues or keys do you have for people for dream interpretation? What should they go to? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that one of the first things that they need to do is that they need to take the opportunity to actually record what they have dreamed or what they have seen if, it, in fact, it's a, if a vision. Um, you know, one of the things that I saw in the scripture was that when Pharaoh had a dream, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, when the butler and the baker in the prison in Egypt had a dream, every one of them experienced a stirring of their emotions, mm -hmm. uh, a, a curiosity. The dream wouldn't leave them. It, it left a lingering uh, sense of something important in the dream. And so I, I think that that's always one of the indicators that God is trying to get our attention. Um, even if you think about Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't even remember what he dreamed. Mm -hmm but he realized that what he had dreamed was important. And so that's why he pursued the wise men trying to help him produce the dream. And so I think paying attention to what you feel when you wake up, paying attention to the emotions that are involved and taking the time immediately to sit down and actually capture it either on paper or on a voice recorder is gonna be one of the most significant things. 
and then just working the process. What about recurring dreams? Are they significant? Yes. I mean, actually, if you look in the scripture, you see Nebuchadnezzar had two dreams. You see that uh, Pharaoh had two dreams. You see that Joseph had the two dreams of the, the sheaves of grain bowing down to his sheave of grain and the sun and the moon and the stars all bowing down to him. So a recurring dream is a pretty good indicator that God is, in fact, trying to get our attention. You know, it says in Job, it says that God speaks one way or in another, but many times God does, man does not perceive it. And so I think it's fair to say that in our busy life, our busy schedules, we may just get too busy to hear God. But then it goes on uh -huh. to say, then in a dream, in a vision of night, while men are slumbering on their beds, then God speaks to them in a dream and instructs them to keep man's soul from the pit and to keep his life from perishing by the sword. So I've personally found in my life that it's so imperative that we listen to the voice of God because God will give us insight, He will give us direction, He will give us warnings, He will give us encouragement, He will, I even believe, impart gifts to us while we sleep. Um, one of the verses that just came to mind is, my people perish for lack of vision. And, you know, sometimes that's what, what, what plan and purpose are we trying to walk out in our life. But in American culture today, I think to a degree we've lost the sense of an overall purpose you know, the American dream has sort of become a joke and uh, people are talking badly about it. And I'm sensing people are losing a sense that there is a hope in the future. Are, are you sensing that? Is that coming through in what you're seeing in America today? I agree. You know, I felt like the Lord said to me a couple years ago that we were coming into a time when God's people were going to become so sensitized to his move and to the move of the supernatural among his people, dreams and visions, supernatural things that God wants to do, uh, signs and wonders and miracles uh, 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 active in the, the people of God today. And I felt like the Lord said the reason for that is so that he could restore hope to his church so that the church can restore hope to the world. Hmm. And I think that the world has lost hope. And I think that it's really up to the church to give it back. But if the church has lost hope, if the church has lost its ability to dream, not just sleep speaking of sleeping dreams, but dreaming of what God has said can be ours, then I think that, that we've got to have our hope restored so that we can restore hope to others. That is a wonderful word. Amen. Because <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, I, I look at America today and it's very tempting to say, Okay, uh, judgment's coming. Right. <laughs> it's very tempting to say what we're seeing in our inner cities, what we're, what we're seeing in the racial divide, what we're seeing in federal debt, what we're seeing in foreign policy, what we're seeing in just the overall climate where anything goes. There, right. There's no rule. Uh, anything goes. And then you put on top of that Islamic terrorism, and it's, it can get tempting to say, okay, uh, it's, it's time to go to the mountain cave <laughs> right. and wait. Right. But we really need to be the salt and light. We really need to come in and say there is hope. We can transform. We can change. I know in the natural, this is probably one of the worst spiritual climates that I've seen in my lifetime, mm -hmm. worst natural climate for that matter. But I feel such a sense of excitement inside of me. I feel like we're living in the time of Isaiah chapter 60 when it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord's risen on you. Darkness is going to cover the earth. Deep darkness is going to cover the people. But in the middle of all that darkness, God's going to rise on us. His glory is going to be seen on us. And then we're going to see kings and nations come to that light. So I'm I'm strangely very excited about the season that we're in. I'm taking a deep dive into Isaiah myself right now. Very good. And I'm learning he is the prophet of comfort. That's right. And specifically the prophet of comfort for the last days. You know, I had a dream last night here when mm -hmm. I flew in for the program. Um, I had a dream and I saw this house and it was an old New England style house. Um, it wasn't my house. It wasn't our church. Um, it was a kind of an older house. And it had suffered damage from a storm. And when I was surveying the damage of the storm, huge chunks of the roof had been like literally just ripped away from this house. And I knew what I was looking at was I was looking at the house of our nation. And a couple of things struck me. The roof is what covers, it's what gives shelter, what gives safety and protection to the whole home. 
And um, as I was talking to the people about the damage, they said 400 mile an hour winds did this. Now, you and oh. I both know that 400 mile an hour winds would have completely laid that yeah. thing flat, but it was still standing. And I felt like the 400 mile an hour winds were the last 400 years of establishment in this nation and how the winds have battered it and have, have, have torn chunks out of it, if you will. But the thing that impressed me was that the foundation was actually still there. The foundation's there. And a roof can be repaired. Right. A foundation's a whole different thing. Yeah, the now Bible you, even says that. What do the righteous do when the foundation is Exactly, if, but a roof, if it's left unrepaired, eventually the entire structure will erode. But when I saw this in the dream, I realized, you know what, there is hope for America because the foundation is still here. There may, we maybe have got some work to do, but the foundation's still here. And I felt such a promise from the Lord in that well, let's dream. Let's break out the tarp. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a good idea, a good idea. Let's get some prayer covering going. <laughs> I agree. And uh, let's pray for America. Amen. Well, if you want more information about how God could be speaking to you through your dreams, Jane's books is available. It's Dreams and Vision, and you can get it anywhere where books are sold. Well, coming up, a baby girl is born with a birth defect that makes it nearly impossible to eat and see how you help turn her life around when we come back. When Marjorie was born, her parents went through the gamut of emotions. They were immediately in love with their baby girl, but also full of fear because she needed surgery they could never afford. In the village of Isabel in the Guatemalan countryside, I met a six-month-old little girl named Marjorie and her dad and mom, Cesar and Chrisley. When I saw her for the first time, I felt happy and sad at the same time. I've never seen a baby like that. The worst part about Marjorie's cleft lip and palate was that it made it difficult for her to eat. That left her underweight and malnourished. She has trouble eating. Sometimes the milk doesn't go to the stomach, but into her lungs. Marjorie's parents got her this prosthetic palate, hoping it would help her eat. It's just a hard piece of plastic. It's uncomfortable, and in fact, it makes her choke even more. On top of that, it would just be a temporary fix anyway. And Marjorie's parents know that if she has to grow up with a cleft palate, she'll have no real hope for a decent future. I work as a janitor and the salary is not enough to pay a surgery. We learned about Marjorie's condition when a relative called CBN. We started by bringing her fortified milk and vitamins so she could gain the weight she needed for surgery. Her parents couldn't believe she was finally going to get the help she needed. I felt nervous since my daughter was going to have a surgery. A month later, Marjorie was cleared for surgery. CBN covered all the expenses. I am so happy and thankful to God because the surgery was a success. After recovering for about a week, Marjorie could finally eat normally. She's gained weight and grown, and her future is now bright. I thank CBN for letting the miracle of putting a smile in my daughter's face to occur. Thank you. I can't believe she has a beautiful smile now. It's so exciting. Muchas gracias a CBN. Thanks, CBN, for my daughter's operation, and may God bless you. And may God bless you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that surgery. A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people around the world. If you're not a member, join with us. Join in everything we're doing. It's real easy. All you got to do is say, yes, I want to be a part of it. How much is it to join? Just $20 a month. 65 cents a day. So if you want to, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. Now, when you call and join, I've got something for you. It's our gift to you. It's called the Gospel of John. And it's an audio version read by my father. And, and so often we read the word, but there's something that happens when we hear it. And it gets into our spirit. It's a different experience for you. Uh, so it's the Gospel of John, my favorite gospel. Uh, it's called the Gospel of Love, and it's yours when you join. So if you'd like it, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, coming up, the story of a soldier whose truck ran directly over an IED. 
I could feel myself being thrown about like a rag doll. I could see this smoke just billowing out, and I could taste it in my mouth. Find out how he survived and then made history after this. Within the U.S. military, the Green Beret has been called a badge of courage. Only the members of the Army Special Forces can wear the symbol of excellence. Mike Fairfax is among the elite, and he didn't stop being one of America's best, even after he nearly lost his life. Mike Fairfax didn't give much thought to what he would do after high school. He thought even less about God. It was probably the furthest thing from my mind, you know, is that the only thing I was worried about was having fun and, you know, going out to, to bars and drinking alcohol. God was a, the, the furthest thing from my mind. After graduation, Mike enlisted in the Army and eventually joined the Army's Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. On July 31st, 2005, Mike and his team were driving along a riverbed in a ground mobility vehicle. They were on a mission to inspect a polling site for Afghanistan's national election. Mike was driving. All of a sudden, you know, it was a, a loud, very loud sound. It was totally deafening. And I knew exactly what was happening. Major Sam Robbins was in the passenger seat. I think it actually might have knocked me out uh, for a few seconds and then just kind of coming to, so to speak, and looking up and just seeing oil and gunk all over the, uh, the windshield. They had run over an IED. I could feel myself being thrown about inside the vehicle, you know, like a rag doll. I could see this smoke just billowing out, this real thick gray smoke, and I could taste it in my mouth. This great fear, you know, struck me and the first thoughts in my mind was I was like please God don't let me die the next thought in my mind was I gotta get out of this vehicle before maybe it burns to the ground my right leg is, is, is felt very numb you know it just I knew something was wrong with it and I just didn't know what unfortunately for Mike he took the the least the path least, the least resistance and went through and broke through uh, the metal broke through on the right side which ended up breaking his leg and, and, and severing his femoral artery Mike was bleeding out. He also had a partially collapsed lung, and his right eye was hanging out of its socket. It's that fear of, of dying that, you know, that I, I was like, God, just please don't let me die. Medics slowed the bleeding until the medevac chopper arrived. They flew him to a trauma center in Germany. By then, he had gone through 20 units of blood. The Army also flew in his wife, Paula, to be with him. I sat down beside him and I uh, sort of started talk, trying to talk to him to, you know, let him know that I was there. Paula was by his side when Mike woke up. The first words I hear is, you know, um, you know, hey, baby, I'm here to take you home. <sighs> she said, you promised me you won't come home. Mike was still in critical condition. He and Paula were put on a plane headed back to the States. Lying on a stretcher, he cried out to God again. I was so scared of dying. You know, I'm still, still there. My, my heart was racing, you know, blood pressure was through the roof. My heart rate was through the roof. And, and I didn't want to die without, you know, setting Jesus Christ as, as my savior. I said, Lord, please forgive me for every bad thing I've ever done in my life. I said, please forgive me for every time I've turned my back on you. I said, you know, Jesus, just please wash me in your blood. Please wash every, every sin that I've ever done. Wash it away. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for not, you know, living my life for you. I'm sorry for, for all the bad things I've done, for turning my back on you. I, 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 in an instant after, after that, I had this overwhelming sense of calm. Somewhere over the Atlantic, halfway between a war and his home, and right beside his wife, Mike Fairfax surrendered his heart to Jesus Christ. And I felt like I was being, I was being carried, as you would like a child or something. And you know, I was trying to, you know, look, 
look up to see who it was. It was this bright, shining light just glowing behind this person's head that was basically, you know, overshadowing, you know, the, the facial features and, and, and everything. And, but I knew who it was, you know, it was Jesus. And I, I knew who it was. Mike endured four and a half months of rehab and skin grafts. By 2008, Mike was jumping out of planes as the first amputee to graduate from the Army's Jumpmaster School. But he struggled with post-traumatic stress disorder for nearly 10 years. I was just, I was broken. That's the only way I can explain it. I was just totally broken. I couldn't function, you know. I got a wife and four kids and, you know, I, I wasn't being there for them. I couldn't even be at work. You know, I was leaving work by 11 o'clock and climbing inside the bed because I couldn't function. In 2014, with the help of Task Force Dagger, a Christian group run by a former Green Beret, Mike learned how to face PTSD head on. Task Force Dagger was just part of God's plan. The whole time he was breaking me and molding me and breaking me and molding me. There's so many programs out there that want to help soldiers with PTSD and, and depression, but there's one thing that's missing from every single program, and that's God. Hi. Today, Mike, Paula, and their children live in North Carolina. Mike retired from the Army in June of 2016. He's finishing up his bachelor's degree in exercise and sports science and plans to start his own ministry. He especially wants to help those who struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. Jesus Christ is the only person that can take all that junk out of your heart. Because God is the only person that can give you joy. Not happiness, joy. Because if you look in Webster's Dictionary and you look at the definition of joy, it says a source of extreme happiness. And God is that source. You know, do you want to live happy or do you want to live with joy in your heart? You can live with joy. You can have that permeate your very being. There can be a well springing up into new life. For you, for, for, for many of us, have you gone through some kind of traumatic situation? Maybe it wasn't as bad as what Mike went through, but have, have you gone through something that robbed you of your joy, robbed you of your outlook on life, robbed you the, the thing that gets you up in the morning, gets you out the door? What was that thing? And sometimes it's even painful to go back and look at it. But with God, you can look at it. And maybe some of you are asking the question, well, where was God when that was happening to me? You know, just as Mike probably asked that question, why did I go over that IED? What happened? Where's my leg? Uh, why is my eye hanging out of my face? What, what happened? Why did it happen? Well, here's the source for you, and it's the source of joy. When you understand that walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you get the ability to fear no evil because you know that he is with you. Now, Mike had a direct encounter with a living God. He had Jesus leaning over his cot. He was crying out to him. He thought he was near death. And Jesus appeared to him, manifested to him. The Bible says that Jesus will do that for you. He will manifest himself to you. It may not be in the same way, in the same experience that Mike had, but he will. In the, the Greek word there is literally he turns on the light. You get to see. And in that process, you get to see that he's with you, that he's got you that no matter what's going on or what has happened to you, he is able to see you through. And he's able to give you joy, true joy, not some kind of made up, manufactured, but true, springing up from your innermost being, a source of joy so that you can look forward to life. 
and you don't have to live in that memory. You can live expecting a great future, a great life ahead of you. How do you get this? Well, it's actually really simple. You do the same thing that Mike did. You ask for it. Now here's Mike, he's near death, and he starts confessing, and he says, I want to be free from all these things. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Set me free. Here's a prayer for you. It's a very simple one. Jesus, if you're there, if this is real, if you can really give me joy, if you can really heal me from these memories, if you can really forgive me, could you show me? Could you show up for me? If you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer it. It's not a prayer you do jokingly. It's not a prayer that you do casually. But if you pray that with all of your heart, he'll hear, he'll answer. The Bible promises that when you seek him with all of your heart, then you'll find him. If you need help with this, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. one 800 707,000. We leave you this word from Acts. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams.